Good evening. I'm Rachel Marston, the Associate Director of the Literary Arts Institute of the College of St. Benedict. Welcome to the last event of the spring 2021 um, semester of our Minnesota Street Reading Series. Please look for updates about our 21-22 series on the Literary Arts Institute webpage. I want to begin um, by offering a land acknowledgement. The land we gather on today in Minnesota and at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University is the traditional homeland of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. The Literary Art Institute honors and respects the indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from and are still connected to this territory. Tonight, we have the privilege of hosting Sean Webster, a Minnesotan poet, sound artist, graphic designer, and parent who lives in North Minneapolis. Webster is also a member of the Black Midwest Initiatives Council, which is stepping in to address the, quote, dearth of academic scholarship and popular writing about both the historic and contemporaneous experiences of Black Midwesterners. Webster's debut book, Gentrification, won the Minnesota Book Award for Poetry in 2018. Webster is an artist whose work demands that you show up and attend to what you hear, to what is happening on the page, and to what is happening in the world around you. His book, Gentrification, defies genres in many ways, operating at the multiple interstices of poetry, documentary, visual art, and criticism. In his poems and essays and articles, Webster troubles, complicates, and expands the discourse around race and identity, examining how racialized identity is assigned, described, and languaged, and the kind of violence and visibility and invisibility that reside in those spaces. As Webster writes in Communique Number no. 2 in Gentrification, but trouble don't show, too busy doing what trouble always done, making trouble. He interrogates and plays with language itself, considering the constructedness of meaning, whether through repetition or typography, through striking out text or layering the same word over itself again and again, such as the words black and bodies, to make the text almost, but not quite, illegible. His work is a manifesto, a call to action, a hearkening to future selves, carving out the space and the time, a space of possibility for survival, particularly for people of color and marginalized folks. In his April 2020 essay, In Consideration from My Next Future, What Gwendolyn Brooks Taught Me About Tomorrow's Geography, Webster is contemplating Audre Lorde's articulation of how we were never meant to survive and poses this question, how to go about living in a world founded on your dispossession. While Webster acknowledges, quote, that doom is where we are, he also calls to us and to himself, writing, quote, because in my next future, I desire a future past where I intend, intended, however impossibly, to survive. Please join me in welcoming Sean Webster. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. Um, Rachel, that was uh, very moving and very, um, very much a, um, something that touched my heart. Like, and so I appreciate um, the way that you've read my work and engaged my work. Um, I'd like to also just thank um, everyone who was involved in, um, in bringing me out, not just this evening, but throughout the course of this semester. Uh, it has been uh, a, a pleasure just to be able to engage with students about, about this work. And so um, thank you uh, for everyone that has, uh, has been involved, both in bringing me out, but then also in the engagement of the work. Um, I'm going to be reading some new work this evening. And I, uh, yeah, am going to just kind of be uh, reading from some longer, uh, some longer work. 
So, um, yeah, bear with me. I'm reading to you all today from the north side of Minneapolis, from five and a half square miles that in the state of Minnesota has become a shorthand for blackness. I am reading after Dante Wright, after Makia Bryant, after George Floyd, and before them too. I am reading to you all today in the shadow of military occupation and under renewed attention to the murder of black people, an attention that does not put a stop to this ritual, a ritual that is the basis of the psychic and social life of this world. I am writing at the edge of the end of the world because that is what is at stake with uprooting anti-blackness. It would mean an end to the world. I am writing before that and after that too. Whale song are waiting in the water at the end of the world. Quote, who is this animal man? End quote. Samuel R. Delaney, Babel 17. To be swallowed by a great fish in the belly of the whale at the end of the world might be as good a place as any to begin. What does it mean to be in the belly of the whale? To be in the belly and the whale. This is meant to say something about being, not only at the end of the world, but being itself and its zero, which is to say blackness. Somewhere in the water moves a big fish, sounds like a catch, moves like a hunted thing. Its dark body, somewhere in the water, a big fish is a gold rush. Loot, mined for the resource of its dark body. Somewhere in the water, a big fish sounds like sea monster. Cetacean from Katos, its dark body somewhere in the water as a haunt and the source of modernity torn from its dark body. Somewhere in the water, a big fish isn't a big fish. It is trade, a ledger mark, its dark body somewhere in the water as a metaphor, a fact of capital registered from its dark body. And there are bodies that are mined, dismembered, distortions of distortion, See Warren, situated solely as function, not persons. Perhaps here I will disclose my disavowal of humanist terms. That that category holds its shape by way of the figure of the Negro, the Negro doing the double work of being border for the human and the animal. There are no persons here, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. We are talking about bodies, the whale, and in the belly of the whale. Pull the body close, right alongside you. It is yours now. Prepare the tools, sharpen them. The precious parts are made so by extraction. Remove what you need. It is yours now, not a body. A precious means to fetch a price. Name it something phallic. It is yours now. Come make a market of your precious head matter. Make a candle. Light your way. It is yours now. Not alive. A calculus of precious trade. No body here. A lit dinner. A lantern law. So many gallons, it is yours now. Precious stench, rank dominion. This corpse, it is yours now. Make your will so as though nothing here was precious. I'm interested 
in impossibilities, like what it means to stare squarely at the end and then look beyond it. Species impossibilities, such as breathing underwater. Nothing is a new world liquid asset. It knows what it is to be underwater. Nothing knows what it is to be impossible. For death to not be an event, but a state of being. To make a noise from within the wake. And what consideration can be made of a howl? The scream, noise emerging from the belly. How can one utter anything under the water? Pip jumps to Pequod to meet with Jonah in the belly of an unspecified whale for drinks. Movie pitch. So somewhere circling the dark continent, rounding the expanse of that large mass of land out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, somewhere out on that water aboard the Pequod, we got Pip. Crew called him Blackling and Boy, sounds small enough to not have a name, a kind of fabricated presence. Yeah, Pip gets tired of being there and not, a place like so many caskets aboard some mobile graveyard. And Pip is thirsty, mouth so dry he think he might consume the sea, and so he jumps overboard. Meanwhile, Jonah been doing a short stint in the belly of an unspecified whale that happens to pick Pip up on his way to the seafloor, and they get to talking over a couple of drinks. Film concludes with the steady build of Pip and Jonah's riotous laughter over Nineveh and the obsessions some men cannot seem to satiate in the worlds they intend to never consider saving. Cue music, fade to black. My granddad knew the belly of the whale. No Jonah. No summoning to collect the pieces of a world that presumed death. He knew the belly of the whale. Something in the depths, seen but not seen. Or perhaps that is the error of a name. Animal. Human. And that which stands between a ghost inside the Leviathan. His father rode it north to a perceived elsewhere. Surrounded by the water, he drunk himself to some kind of beyond. Body. Noun. One. A. The organized physical substance of an animal or plant, either living or dead, as one. The material part or nature of a human being. Two, the dead organism, corpse. Three, the person of a human being before the law, be a human being, person. There is no one body falling. One is a modern fact, another kind of decomposition. One is not a body, a discrete figure. One is falling. An assemblage, no one falling. Dark spaces carry a body. There is no one, an assemblage, a feast of falling. One is not a body, one is a whale falling. An assemblage, a dark space carrying nothing more than a body. Make the incision just below the hole. Steady your hand and sever the strip in two. Remember, you are cold, and this black mass, after being cut rightly, may help your chilled flesh and bones. Remember, a form of warmth. Steal yourself and peel a blanket or two. There are no thieves here. You must remember the minion need not ask. Wrap yourself in a sheet of the black mass of flesh before you. Remember, this dark creature is a known quantity, something measured, a candle's exchange value. Remember the righteousness of possession. Slake your bitter hunger until there is nothing to remember. W, or an expression for the whale, the whale 
which is to say water, which is to say world. W has four common forms. Peel back the flesh, hold the layers, an architecture of muscle and bone, fold again, disaggregate the body, its many precincts, loop back, a throaty rattle, fold another body, peel the flesh, shake together the bones, then apart, fold again, peel until nothing is whole, nothing, just a world. Where in the belly of the whale is misnomer, the belly of the world. Whereas some monsters can collapse their lungs, take their residence among deep unknown fathoms to breathe, they breach the space between worlds, liminal creatures, something, everything other, other, and they breathe. Whereas a monstrous thing can be entangled, more than single, multiple and without borders, breathe and split the fiction of autonomy. Breathe, there is no distance from the water here. Up, up, and breathe, a kind of riotous practice, an anarchy of breathing. Whereas monsters are hunted and breathe at risk of being greeted by a cold harpoon, whereas revolt because they can no longer breathe. Pip jumps the Pequod to snag some pearl for lunch before planning a mutiny, movie pitch. Scene begins with a black screen and the emerging sound of a slow whistle, light builds, audience sees Pip as he prepares to jump the Pequod. Hungry, the crew believes there is something to Pip's body that makes it require less, continued whistle. That Pip might not need oxygen, his animal body a hybrid thing that need only surface occasionally. Pip dives into the water, descends a few fathoms down, hoop net in hand to snag some pearl. Time lapse. Everyone aboard is hungry and wondering where their meal is since it has been hours. Continued whistle builds louder. Meanwhile, Pip, mouth full of oysters, bend below deck, seen and not seen, fashioning a slow whistle into a howl. Well, to begin, any place might be a world, might be an end. To be swallowed in the world in the end might be as good a end as to be in the belly of the great fish, to be at the end of the whale. I am unsure where this is being written. What it means to write a fragmented thing, to fragment a thing a body, a spine, text everywhere. I am unsure this is a trustworthy thing. In fact, I am sure this is a thing not to be trusted in the belly at the end. Take me to the water. There is something impossible about the land. Pip jumps the Pequod after hallucinating about the human and subsequently giving up on land. Movie pitch. It begins with a fever dream. Pip haunted by the ground he stands on, something terrible about its sureness, its carcerality. No, it begins somewhere in his torn open throat, slit wide by a harpoon, camera panning each angle of Pip's neck as he wails, Look, a Negro! It begins with nothing, screen black, dark as the ocean floor. No, it begins with something. A body, itself a theory of how we matter in the world. Laying on the deck of the Pequod, attempting to float, misjudging the surface for water, mistaking his lack of sinking for buoyancy. No, it begins with a disavowal of land, with Pip tasting that salt water and it doing something like the opposite of stripping him of wings. Pip jumps the Pequod. No, it begins. How have the dead entered here? The dead are monstrous, are matter, are your cognitive foil, are. Whale, whale body, black water, black whale, whale body, 
water body black, black body whale, whale water, whale water whale, whale black whale, body black body body black black body, water whale whale, whale whale, whale water, water whale, water whale, body water whale, black water, water water, black water, water black water, body whale, water whale, black whale, 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 whale. As though the body of the whale were a body, were a being, were a black being in the water, in an other world, whale, and let the eruption from the body rend the world. B minus B. Quote, animal being opens up a space between the manifestation and metaphysics between appearance and the unconscious. Stated as formula, the animal can be pictured as being minus being, being or B minus B, pure negation. Akira Mizuta Lipid, electric animal. Quote, to say we must be free of air while admitting to knowing no other source of breath is what I have tried to do here. End quote. Frank Wilderson, red, white, and black. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. In the water, gonna wade, gonna trouble, gonna children in the water. Gonna water, gonna wade, gonna gods in the water, children wade, children water, children gods in the water, trouble water, trouble wade, trouble children, trouble gods in the water, gods trouble in the water, gods children wade in the water, trouble, gonna water the wading children of God, gonna trouble the children wading, gonna water the children in God's water, in the children's water, gonna trouble the trouble in the water, the wading children are finished wading in the trouble, in the water, the wading children gonna trouble the gods. One, a child born in the water may take longer to draw breath before they wake. We often dream of flying, a kind of weightlessness that carries us up, up, up. We know we are dreaming outside the world of the dream. We are afraid of heights, careful to not look down, can feel our body mass, heavy, salt blood. The people could fly until they couldn't. Salt kept us closer to the water. The water is the birthplace of new world blackness. Blackness ain't just in the water. Blackness is the water. One B minus B. A woman miscarried and the child died by delivery. in which the fevered hands attend to the body, beguile asphyxiation of its abstract work. Walcott taught us that the sea is history, that interwoven into the depths are countless stories, actual bones. There was a time when we had belief, when we were a believer in a kind of delivery, not this body, no, but something animating this flesh would be delivered, that the bones could be gathered. There was a time when we believed, when we being delivered had belief that we had been born again. There are many births as there are many bellies of the world. Two, our partner gave birth to our child, fully submerged in the water, the first few moments suspended. Once removed from the water, it took a while before the child would breathe. The doctor said this is normal. Sometimes we wonder if black children are already aware of a world set on making their breathing an impossibility. We count so many years in the seconds before a first breath, something like a living death, a middle passage. We name our child Ocean. 
A breath holding spell is a common event among young children. A breath holding spell can be brought about when startled. Sometimes children are startled. A breath holding spell can bring a child in and out of consciousness. Water. Water is the weather, is the wake, is the wade. Water is the work, is the whale, is the world. In the wake of the body, the baptism. In the wake is a world. Quote, ontology, once it has finally admitted as leaving existence by the wayside, does not permit us to understand the being of the black. End quote. Two, B minus B. Excuse me, Franz Fanon. Two, B minus B. A woman miscarried and the, her. See them collecting the oxygen, gathering it against curated disaster. See their hands work. In 1675, Peter Blake would captain the James, a vessel that was to make its way to Barbados with what was to be described as cargo. Held in the birthplace of New World Blackness, one of Glissant's bellies of the world, what is born from the hold of the ship is not alive. What is born from the hold of the ship is the sentient dead, abstracted to give shape to life, documented at the site of ruin. Wake. Wherein Pip considers advising Ahab to lose his human coordinates, but jumps the Pequot instead. Movie pitch. Scene begins with Pip approaching Ahab, a slow walk meant to dramatize the long duration of silence, the absented speech that forms Pip's there and not thereness, the slow walk of contraband, each step an appeal to rain, remain obscure, for the thing you are is smuggled, a secret as open as the water, and then, midway to Ahab, Pip gives attention to the sea, its sound, the applause of the water against itself, the din of the deep having its own syntactical order, and then, without saying a word, looking back only to offer a wry smile, and with no maps to guide them, Pip jumps the Pequod, back arced as a dorsal fin, marine opening up with the hum of uncountable life forms shifting in and out of each other, and then, somewhere out in the water, somewhere in the deep, where no more than that blue drink is visible, Pip emerges like air and sound and all of that a world. Three, and how many moments are given to the child? How long before the child is a body never to wake? Ocean cries, a full-throated cry, a rattle long and full, do not hold the child too tightly. Do not squeeze them. We make assessments of a lifetime of danger, something like scanning the water for sharks, an English name for a strange fish, a nomenclature, a nomenclature developed by merchants over years on the water attempting to make an other so that the so-called human could hold its shape. Shark from choke, pronounced choke from the Maya in the Caribbean. We gasp, do not hold the child too tightly. There are sharks in the water. This body is a fiction. What of the flesh? Strange fish occupy the water. Three B minus B. Woman and child, her and and died after delivery. To conceal a living body, one not meant to survive, see a song, a lament, the willful work. In the Book of Mortality aboard the James, a constellation of disasters, an apocalypse by another name, in the ledger a child was said to be born, the body discolored, a child of the water. In the dead book, this discolored body may take longer to draw, is, going, is gone upon arrival. No possibility of breath. The body is a corpse, Webster tells us. The child is but a body. In the Book of Mortality aboard the James, 
The child is said to be born dead. The child is said to die two days later. To be swallowed by the belly of the end of the world might be a place to begin. To be of the whale at the end might be to begin. Four, is a child of the water aboard the vessel a child at all? What is left of an, in an unchild's wake? What is left in the unmaking of the child, which is to say, what is left in the unmaking of childhood, when the rent is too high for us to find lodging there? This is not an argument around innocence. The child is not innocent, a hollow word, an imaginary border. The child is an ocean, which is to say, possible. My body given out the animal. My body given distorted is for B minus B. The dead and rotten and to delivery. Entangled with the journal of mortality, one that only sees what is assumed gone, its work. The question that compresses you is a matter of black life. The question is a matter of black death being an event or what constitutes blackness itself. If living aboard the mobile graveyard, it is to be in excess of this burial ground. If living, it is to steal breath or hide it. Blackness as excess is as close as you can approximate to otherwise. For to be alive through a passage the ledger cannot see on the floating tomb is to be outside logic, is to be unimaginable, something without a grammar. To the end of the world, a place. To end the world might be to begin. Five, who can rouse the breath like a mother or hide it like a hunted thing? A child is not awake. Breathe, softer child. Tuck our breathing beneath the water, though there be sharks there. Make something of our body itself a technology also. Make a maroon, a saltwater wraith. Make an underwater country, Drexia, deep in the black Atlantic. Make our body part of the storm. Unsettle the water. Sprawled out, the Negro is distorted, the animal. My body was 5B minus B miscarried her and rotten and died days after delivery. To obscure in hollow numbers, to make vanish in ditto dittos, see what is not said, outwork the premature grammar of death. It's cold logic. See, somewhere in the margins, the dead lungs work. You are long past believing in recovery, in believing there is something to be recovered. Snatch something from the water, but what of letting the dead speak? What of the interstice of 48 hours where a presumed corpse may have had a hushed breath? There are no spells here for raising the dead, but there are dead speaking wailing as they wade in the water. This is not an attempt at resolution. This might be a failed attempt to work against it, to demand ellipsis of these fraught symbols, and what this be and ain't doesn't believe it can wretch an answer from the water. It is an ensemble of ontological questions tucked in a whale that was meant for the wake. The dead are speaking, wailing above and below the water line. Six, 
Wake the child while no one is looking. Steal breath through a passage the ledger cannot see. Wake, wake the child somewhere an account is not given. Snatch something from the water that was meant for the wake. The child is more than a body, which is to say multiple, which is to say not reducible to a presumed corpse, something already drowned, ocean in the deep, ocean in the boundless parts. Ocean is more than a burial ground, a wake fixed in some linear fantasy of time. Ocean at the end of the world, at the morning after it, a cry whistling, carried on the wind through the water, a whale song teaching us to breathe. Wherein Pip concludes his body is not single and self-identical, wherein Pip determines he is also the whale and swallows the Pequod, movie pitch. It is unclear where on the journey Pip decided a single body was unsuitable, but each day he would work depths of 40 feet, then 80 feet, then twice that again. It begins by learning not so much to hold one's breath, but how to better distribute the oxygen. A shrinking of the spleen, a releasing of oxygen-rich blood cells. One learns how to slow the heart rate. One remembers something of their self that began in the water. What if the distance between the whale and the belly of the whale were imagined, were nothing more than a myth? What if Pip could insist on other folk tales, on an assemblage of materials and temporalities continually passing through them? Then it is not so much a stretch to say one relegated to silence, the speculative position of the non-human animal is also the whale. That Pip could make new things of their body and swallow whole the things carrying the so-called old. It is unclear where on the journey Pip made these new things of his body, but who rides the Pequod when they can ride the ocean? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, what a pleasure to hear you read from this new work. I am still just trying to take, take it all in. I was um, so moved by what you shared with us tonight. Um, so one of the questions that I wanted to start with um, and I think this is evident in both gentrification and then also the work that you were reading from tonight, but that your work is deeply engaged in conversation with other authors and ideas, and as well as um, investigating language and how we create meaning. Um, can you talk about this discursive nature of your work and, um, and, and how and why you're engaging in that kind of project? Yeah. You know, I, I think I'm, I'm not so sure where, like, or how, like, you know, these things kind of come about, but, you know, for so much of, um, of my time writing and so much of my time thinking about performance, um, has always kind of been a part of various kinds of conversations, you know? And so, um, I, I tend to like try to, you know, I think that school taught me to kind of think of things as discrete bodies of knowledge as like isolated in some particular kind of way um but to to my that was counterintuitive to my upbringing that was counterintuitive to the way that i experienced knowledge um to the to the ways that i experienced like the production of knowledge right that you know growing up in spaces that were always kind of like a part of a free-flowing conversation that, uh, you know, didn't necessarily have an end, but also, like, you know, it would you know, maybe pause and then pick up. And, you know, so I think that the way that I think about writing tends to, you know, be influenced by that, right? That um, that I don't want to, I don't want to think of my, my own kind of authorial position as, like, singular, um, that, that I want to take into account in a very serious way uh, the way in which I, I want to be a part of a tradition and, and I want to be a part of um, a number of conversations and I want to make that very evident in the work you know so yes no and I think that um, that for me is very evident in your work and 
sorry, I, I now have, I had my questions prepared and now I have pages of notes after hearing you read too. So I have to, I'll see where I find, but I was thinking too about this, um, this, this relationship then and something you were just saying about being in conversation and that continuation. And I, there is a, um, there is this return a recursiveness that happens in your work, um, both in the repetition of words, but also ideas and phrases that I think is playing with time and temporality in this way that speaks to that tradition that you were talking about too. Um, so one of the, th um, so, so one of the other questions I was thinking about um, with gentrification, but then that you're building on a different way in this new work tonight is this concept of mapping but also about location, dislocation, and boundaries, right? So in this new work, it's really engaged with the sea and then the belly of the whale in particular as a space. Mm -hmm. But could you talk about this idea of mapping and boundaries, of maps and the sort of sp spatial and temporal locations as signs, but especially to considering um, as your work so often does about how black bodies and bodies of color are bounded, defined, policed, erased, but also then how it becomes a space of possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that in gentrification, like in a very more, uh, a much more, um, you know, direct fashion, like I'm thinking about mapping uh, in terms of how uh, the phenomenon of gentrification, like, is is something that's very much rooted in in, in a colonial practice, like in a settler. A settler colonial practice mm -hmm. right and so um i think you know mapping mapping and cartography as a practice is just so much a, a part of colonialism you know and so um how how do we uh think about the known world and what is mapped and what is known and what is uh known as 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 something that's only kind of um transcribed through its its understanding as being possessed um and so um when you think of like you know this kind of 1492 moment of like Columbus coming to uh, the so-called New World, um, this is a moment where you know this place in North America is considered to be uh, is is considered to be uh, barren and and is considered to be empty, right? And so that kind of emptiness uh, serves a a a notion of it being un, not possessed, right? And so the mapping of it is a part of like the kind of possessing of it. And I'm I'm interested in how do we work against mapping? How do we work against um, that kind of uh, notion of like possession? Um, and and folks like folks like Renato Wakai make a really strong case that if if we're to take seriously abolition, as many folks are calling for now, um, and and so many. Have been calling for for so for so long, uh, but that if we to take if we to take seriously abolition, the abolition as a project is not just thinking about the abolition of prisons and the abolition of police, but that if we're to do away with the kind of violence that we see on black bodies, we have to do away with property. We have to abolish property itself. Um, and our relationship to property as black people as having once been property is so much a part of that is wrapped in that right and that's and that's also a part of this history of like mapping so so you know the work is trying to like explode that the work mm -hmm. is trying to um to to make that something that is uh uh has to you know mapping attempts to conceal its intentions in so many ways right like uh and so so it's about how how to make sure to 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 make apparent that which is is often concealed right um and and to conceal that which is often apparent for the purposes of surveillance right like so it's about how do you hide a thing you know um so yeah yeah i was i mean i i think that um well i was thinking as you're reading in this new work, this a lot of the language about ownership and possession that was recurring in there, but then thinking about this disruption and how do we expose it, but this idea of concealment, right? Because something that I have seen at work um, 
in the work of yours that I've read is very much this trying to examine then too and put a lot of pressure on language because of the way that language then is both revealing and concealing simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And so how do you, like, you know, I think that, you know, we, we tend to think of language then in a, a, as something to be trusted, right? Like as something that is like kind of uh, neutral in a way, mm -hmm. right? And, and so then a part of it is to say that, um, like, you know, M. Norbese Phillip talks about how, how like language is inherently distrustworthy. It's not, it's not to be trusted, right? Like, I mean, um, the way that, uh, you know, in this new work, you think about the, the language around, like, you know, the naming of things, right? The naming of the sperm whale. The sperm whale isn't named the sperm whale for any sort of anatomical reasons, right? But, like, we, we have this, this desire to possess and to possess through the phallic, right? And so that, that naming of the sperm whale as, like, something connected to the phallic is about possession, is about how we claim a kind of ownership over a thing, right? And the same is true over the claiming of like black bodies as not being their own, right? Like, and so um, how to how to like take into consideration like how how language is something that's always already fraught, um, and and like a part of a part of like a part of like the work is about how do you abstract that, right? How how to like um, engage in that at a higher level of abstraction. So yes, and how do you challenge the reader then too, um, both when you're performing your work, but also on the page, to not be able to just sort of fall in to the expected narrative, right, yeah. or the beauty of the language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, and I mean, in some ways, like sometimes that language is is meant to be beautiful in order to talk about how we conceal the violence and the beauty, mm -hmm. right? Like, or how, like, for instance, right? Like, you know, I was, you know, been very, very much thinking about the the onslaught of, uh, of murders that are mm -hmm. becoming, like, more, I think, apparent to people, but I've always been uh, around, right? But um, that that so much of this recurring videos are a kind of looping and a kind of image making um, that resemble in so many ways the lynching photograph, right? And you see in some of these photographs this kind of um, intimacy with a dead body, right? An intimacy with an a gratuitous kind of violence, right? Um, and so I think that language oftentimes tends to attempt to uh, present these kinds of intimacies with these gratuitous forms of violence, right? And so sometimes it's meant to like sound, like sound beautiful while saying something quite uh, excessively violent, right? Yeah, well, and yes, and, and, and making us, and asking us then to see that dissonance. And right. I think that pattern especially with the violence, um, this, this history in what is now the U.S. Mm -hmm. of violence towards black bodies in particular right. and indigenous bodies. Um, I have a question from the audience here that came um, from a student that was thinking about Pip and the Pequot. So what was the signific uh, significance then of returning to the story of Pip and the Pequot and altering the story each time yeah i mean with with this i was with this uh you know new thing that i've been working on for for a while now like i think a, a part of of wanting to return to to pip and to the pequot um and also turn through it like through the moving picture right like through a, mm -hmm. a series of movie pitches is is to talk about one like you know the way in which like the still image of the lynching photograph as well as like the moving picture right like it's something that we've developed a particular kind of intimacy with and desire around that violence that we see in those images right and pip is a character in the uh the book moby moby dick for mm -hmm. those who aren't familiar who's one of this um black is a black as a you know kind of soul black character in Moby Dick that ends up uh, taking up a kind of, of absented presence, right? Like that Pip's character um, 
is it is it taking on a narrative arc or character formation in the way of other characters throughout the book, but serves a certain kind of like plot purpose in Moby Dick. It moves the plot forward. Pip moves his plot forward, the plot forward through his absence, through his silence, right? And so, um, returning to Pip, I was trying to reimagine and work against the kinds of 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 absentedness of of Pip's character and the way that that sort of silence of Pip, like the non-speaking of Pip, is often um, something how we associate. Uh, we associate the distinction between the human, the category of the human, mm -hmm. and the non-human animal uh, as being something that is, is distinguished through speech, right? Like that language becomes the distinguishing thing that we talk about uh, between the category of the human and the non-human animal. Um, and oftentimes black folks serve as the border, not just as the outside of the human, but the border between the human and the non-human animal. So, thank you so much for thinking about that. When I um I was thinking about as you had been talking about this language of liminality. So thinking about this idea, this the black body as the border space, and that the language of the monstrous also comes up, um, and a lot of theories about monstrosity, even tied to Moby Dick and the whale are about this sort of excess or things that exceed expected boundary categories. Um, so I was really struck by this uh, return in this new work to thinking about how do you make a multiple voice? You were even talking about this earlier with wanting to eschew this sort of authorial Sing singularity, right? Like that it's like, oh, this is no, I'm part, I'm part of a discourse and a tradition. Um, and it, and you also had used the language of irreducibility. Um, so I know that's not really a question, but I don't know if any of those <laughs> words or ideas uh, raised yeah. something for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, you know, a lot of, a lot of my thinking is about um, work that, that um, is, is really, um, you know, I, I, I just, a lot of my process is, is trying to bring together so many various texts into conversation, right? Like that so much of, uh, of trying to, um, to work on a thing is having an idea, but then like, um, seeing, okay, well, what, what is the sort of, what is the sort of history of like, you know, the way that we think about ontology or how we, mm -hmm. how we start to think about, um, uh, uh, the image and visibility and these sorts of things. So, so I mean, it's it's about bringing you know various things into conversation, and, so, and oftentimes, like you know, those things are uh, things that are seen as 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 discongruous, right? Like, so it's not uh, like th those are things that don't seem to like come together in a particular kind of way. But um, you know, I think that as you as you start to look at various voices, as you start to look at various kinds of uh, of uh of text like both both visual uh sonic um and, and otherwise literary like that you know you there, i just I, I tend to see less like border division between like you know various things right like which is not to say that there is no uh you know by by that elimination that you have have nothing that stands like you know so to speak on its own um, but, but yeah, like I, I just, you know, this work is also, uh, I love the way that like, uh, a, a friend and, and, and great, you know, writer, um, Lillian, uh, Yvonne Bertram mm -hmm. talks about how their work is not discreet, right? Like that, that none of their, like, they're not involved in producing a discreet project, mm -hmm. um, which is you know, now how I try to think about my own work, right? It's like, yeah, like that makes a lot of sense. Like this is, this is not like, you know, as I was saying before, like, you know, I, being a part of a conversation that may pause, it doesn't end, it pauses, it may pick up at another point in the conversation, right? Like, and so this is me trying to pick up something at another point in the conversation and other things that I've been doing. This isn't, um, you know, this may seem in some respects, right? I think a lot of folks might look at this new project as something more of, like, like I'm maybe 
taking a turn in a way um, from from certain things. Um, but again, like you know, other teachers like uh, Douglas Kearney, who's a great another friend and like uh, fantastic poet uh, and mentor, um, talks about like how like you know he's not trying he's not trying to do what's expected in the work. Also, right, like it's like a part of the experiment is to like you know push the boundary, right? Like it's is to not is not do the expected thing. Um, so you know it's an attempt and and sometimes a failure, you know, and and you you know try to fail better like as you go along. Yes, well, and I was thinking too about this, um, going back to the project, um, especially the anti-racist project, right, of pushing back on commodification and possession and, um, and the, the way then too about uh, thinking about a work as not being discreet and also about them being in conversation becomes a way of pushing back on sort of the boundaries of the ownership that often get ascribed to... to um, the author as right. well. Right, for sure. Um, I'm gonna, uh, there was a comment in the chat, um, it's not a question, but that is saying, um, I'm moved by your choice of appropriative verbs when speaking of the whale. Extract, name, light your way, it is yours now. What an evocative way to describe the body as a commodity. Uh, yeah, like, and I mean, and, and it, it is right. Like I mean, it's it's wrapped up in that, always. Um, and I, I was very interested in like you know, like in this in this work. Like you know, I was very interested in the water. I was very interested in the whale, uh, but also like the connection between the water and the Middle Passage and black mm -hmm. bodies and whales and like that sort of the marine. Um, and so in that way, like you know. I, to think about possession is is so much a part of that, um, is so much a part of that period, right? And out of that, right, that that's that's where we get modernity, right? Like it's out of that violence, right? Like and so, um, as we start to think about even our own um, like systems of thinking are wrapped up in that, right? Um, are are inescapably wrapped up in that, so. Um, yeah, it's, it's to, how do you, how do you start to like tr attempt to make that apparent, but also attempt to try to like write against that, you know? Right. And write anew. And is that even possible? I was thinking, um, today as I was uh, getting, uh, thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about, I'd been reading some in Alexis Pauline, uh, Gum's dub and in the, uh, beginning note, she's talking about. Uh, in converse, I mean, the whole book's in conversation with Sylvia Winter, but Gums writes, Winter says we are not homo sapiens, we are homo nerens, not the ones who know, but the ones who tell ourselves that we know. She says we therefore have the capacity to know differently. We are word made flesh, but we make words so we can make ourselves anew. And I was mm. thinking about that a lot as you were reading, because I felt like that, that, that project seemed very much at the heart of your work for sure and i mean sylvia winter is a huge a huge point of reference right so you know um sylvia winter talks about the category of the human as one like that is wrapped up in one like the over representation of man um mm -hmm. and so also talks about so like that black people are outside of the category of the human right inherently so um but that there are other genres like sylvia winter holds out a hope that there are other genres of the human i'm not so sure i hold out the same hope as sylvia winter and so um there's a large conversation debate about like um whether there is any level of recuperability of the category of the human especially of the category of the human as um you know, someone like Wilderson might expound is something that is parasitic on uh, on the black, right? That, mm -hmm. that the category of the human only holds its shape as a result of the exclusive practice, right? Of the exclusion of the black from the category of the human. And so that we are the perpetual other. Um, so, so, you know, tying back to narrative, that narrative is about cohesion, right? Narrative is about like, you know, having a, uh, like, you know, Wilderson explains, like, the moment of plenitude, loss, and then as you kind of 
move through the narrative that you have a recuperating moment, right? Like, you know, you have the denouement, um, but that black people are against narrative, that there is uh, no denouement as his claim in Afro-pessimism for the black, right? That mm -hmm. So, and that narrative being inherently anti-black. Um, and so, you know, in considering that, like, you know, as you were saying earlier, like in terms of possibility of writing a new, or if that is possible, I think that that's a huge question in this work. Is it possible? And I've left that question uh, open um, because, you know, at some level, I'm 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 an agnostic, right? Like I I, I don't really uh, hold much belief uh, that it is possible. It might be, uh, and 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 I I I don't hold a kind of faith in the recuperability of the human as a category. I'm not very interested in that. And I make that pretty clear mm -hmm. at the onset, you know? And so it's like, how, how do you start to like, how do you live in the midst of the impossibility? How do you work out of the impossibility um, is, is kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, and that, that language kept, came up quite a bit for me too when you were, if I can find in my very messy notes here, um, some of the phrases that came up, the edge of the end of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And looking at, I think there was something that, like looking at this, um, I'm, this will not be exactly right, but looking at the zero and the zero is blackness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, I mean, you know, the end of the world, like, I mean, folks like, you know, you brought up Alexis, like, you know, with uh, M archive after the end of the world, but like also mm -hmm. just like thinking about, um, you know, Glaçant's work and others who who speak to like you know when you think about the middle passage when you think about like the sort of rupture that takes place that's a world altering event that isn't that is an apocalyptic event um it is an end of the world right um but there is also like there are so many ends of the world right so like you know there are folks like Alexis who talk about how uh, black feminist thinkers have have talked about so many ends of the world that black folks have experienced and that have we have lived through right um and so um so i tend to read alexis as holding out some level of like uh some level of hope for uh what is what is possible um after the end of the world and like there's a part of me that wants that uh but doesn't necessarily believe it Right. So like there's a part of me that I'm like I, I, and that, I think that that's a part of what I'm attempting to wrestle mm -hmm. with in the text. Right. Is that um, whereas I may have a, a desire for some of that, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a very I'm not a very hopeful like person. Um, like I, I tend to I tend to think that there is something quite irreparable about what has been done at every level through anti-blackness and so um i i'm i'm trying to uh i'm just trying to wrestle with that uh, well yeah and the word that just came to mind is as a, re a a reckoning as well yeah. too right which is that yeah. i think that um that like naming and uh, unnaming right because of the dangers of what language can can mask and I mean you began the poem you began with right was asking to think about like what does it mean to be reading after and before mm -hmm. Dante Wright, Makia Bryant and George Floyd and so many others right so it's like how do we hold hold that history present and 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 the present with us and not use hope as and um, and not to diminish the power of hope, but in some ways as a, and not saying that this is what Alexis Gums is doing, because I don't think that's her project either, but um, that I think hope can sometimes be dangerous in that it can allow us to look away, possibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I wouldn't, like, that's not how I position, like, Alexis's work either. I yeah. like, um, like, I think that there's so much, uh, you know, there's so many ways that one folks talk about like hope, like so for for example, like folks like Miriam Kaba talk about hope as a discipline, right? And so, um, you know, not necessarily like it's not a feeling, um, 
but for myself, like what I'm attempting to to say and to do one like is 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 one like um uh to reckon with how like you know um i I don't have hope uh and two uh to ask very honestly the question of like is it is hope necessary right mm -hmm. um is is hope necessary to the project that I want to be involved in right like um and um yeah open question and i'm again i'm agnostic right like i'm like mm, maybe right but <laughs> like i don't know um and and so it's just it's like like it's it's like you know it's in a in a kind of wilder some type of fashion it's trying it's attempting to pose a question to which you don't perceive there to be an answer right um and and that's like you know that's a difficult thing to hold no that is a very difficult thing to hold um, and I think you've invited us into that space with you in this really generous and open and compelling um, and evocative way. I could keep listing other adjectives. Um, we're about six minutes after eight o'clock, so I want to be mindful of your time and the time of our audience. So I just want to thank you, Sean, so much for sharing your work with us and help um, being in conversation with me um, and all the time you've uh, spent in our classrooms throughout this semester. And um, mm. thank you to Fine Arts Programming for stage managing this event and to the Manitou Fund for supporting the Minnesota Street Reading Series. Um, thanks again to Sean Webster and thank you to the audience for joining us this evening. Have a great night, everyone. Mm.